You are listening to Fanfa Tracks. It's time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. This is Cannon Fodder. Here are your hosts. Brian Cameron. Matt Booker. And Mark Nubo. Grab your big marks, it's time to take cover as we unleash the cannon fodder over the Star Wars galaxy of literature. Cannon fodder is the home and fat attracts radio for everything Star Wars literature, from comics, books, magazines and part works. This month, recorded at MCM London Comic Con, we interview Cavan Scott, famous for a wealth of Star Wars comics and books, ranging from The High Republic through to Adventures in Wild Space. Joining me, Mr. Mark Newbold. Welcome to the show, Mark. Oh, thanks, mate. It's been it's been a while, but I've been looking forward to this. Celebrating also my birthday when we interviewed Calvin, but also the fourth anniversary of uh, Father Tracks itself, so I've just had a little slice of cake. <laughs> that's a good idea. I should grab a slice of cake. I don't think I've got... I've got some mince pies, if that's near enough. I'll have a mince oh, pie. Dude, it's, 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 it's the season for mince pies. It is. It is definitely is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> MCM London Comic Con, what was your overall impressions of the show? It was great to be back out at a big show. I mean, we've done little bits and bobs here and there. We did a small show in Coventry not that long ago. I went up to Doncaster for a show a couple of months back. But as a sizable show, I think MCM London was the first one. And it was one, it was great to catch up with you and have a proper chat and a catch up, which was nice. And, and just to be in a big arena again and, you know, the XL doesn't get much bigger than the XL. Uh, and it was probably, I'd say, what, maybe half capacity, but it still felt busy. Plenty going on. I know that it will, once we get back to normal, I'm doing the waggle in the air, air quotes, you know, normal conventions. It will seem monstrous again, but that's kind of good, you know, getting back into the old swing of things. I really enjoyed it. It was nice. It was good to catch up with Kevin Scott as well. My first Star Wars themed or related convention since uh, February, just before the pandemic really sort of took hold. I've done a few work related events in between, a few work related trips and so on. But yeah, so it was uh, interesting for me, quite impressed in the way that it was done. It felt full, um, I think mainly because they had everything sort of wider aisles, um, more spaced out. Everyone was being slightly, a little bit cautious, I would say, but I think the confidence sort of grew over the weekend and people as well. I think the procedures that they had in place and COVID passports or negative test checks were pretty solid. So I think it it was a comfortable show and I think um, the guys at Repop did well. Oh, totally. Yeah, definitely. And it was good. It's good to see that caution. And it was probably not the most rock and roll thing to say, but, you know, it's given the circumstances, it's good to see people thinking about these things. The queues were well organized. And, yeah, you didn't feel like people were, you know, you're used to being at Celebration or New York or, or like you say, MCM and places like that when it's elbow to elbow. It wasn't like that at all at this, which was, which was good. So, yeah, it was a good weekend. And we've got loads coming up. I mean, Fanta's going to be so busy over the next few weeks heading into 22. It's uh, very encouraging. Yeah, I think as we record this, we're maybe two weeks away from Book of Boba Fett's sort of preview show on yeah. Disney+. Plus. We're going to have Disney Plus Day, as I think it's now called. It used to be the shareholders day, but it's now sort of Disney Plus Day. <laughs> so Sounds sexier. Probably expecting news on Andor, on Obi-Wan, on Willow. Mando Season 3 might get a little look in as well. It's probably further out. I would like to think we'll get to see a first look at Book of Boba Fett with it coming December 29th. So yeah, yeah. lots yeah. going to be happening in the next couple of weeks. Star Wars always goes sort of, I mean, it's always busy. And we can always find stuff to do and talk about. But there are sort of periods, comparatively quiet. And at the moment, I mean, blimey, if you went back 20 years, you wouldn't think it was quiet now. But compared to what's coming, it's quiet. So as you say, with, with that Disney Plus day and, and all the possible reveals, and then as we get into December, it, we're kicking to overdrive again. Don't we? It's nice It's nice to have something in December to look forward to because we've had the films for the last few years and we haven't had that in 2020 or 21 this year and not again for another couple of years until Rogue Squadron. So it's good to have a busy December. But so yeah, it's certainly going to be a, a, a packed January in that sense. <laughs> 
Fanta Drags. We took in a panel that Cavan did. He was interviewed on stage, covered his whole sort of career to date, the various franchises that he's worked on. And obviously a big theme of that was uh, the High Republic. A lot of people had questions on that and Cavan dealt into. So let's talk a little bit about the High Republic. Have you been following all of the content? Have you been picking up the books, picking up the comics, or how have you consumed it so far? I've tried to, to read and or listen to. It's audiobooks tends to be the way that I go mostly these days, as much as I can. I've really stayed on top of the comics. I'm very much enjoying the comics, uh, you know, the Marvel's main title, and really loving IDW's uh, High Republic Adventures. And that's been a joy to review. But as for the main titles, Charles Soule's Light of the Jedi... Cavern's Rising Storm, which obviously got a lot of people talking for obvious reasons. Both fantastic. Really did like Rising Storm. A lot, I think like the general, was it was a very solid introduction into the era. And one of the things that all of them working together as a unit to pull this story together, that no one writer is truly responsible for any one thing. It's a very much a collaborative effort between the group of writers. It's just who writes that particular story. Light of the Jedi was a really good ease into that era because it is a completely fresh era. And that's what I've found the most refreshing. It's nice now, nice vanilla word, but you know what I mean. You know, Star Wars is such a big canvas now. You've got your OT, you've got your PT, you've got your sequel trilogy. You can go back to Old Republic. You, can, you know, you can really move around the timeline if you want to include Legends. There's, there's even more. And to pick a time period in the Star Wars history where the High Republic sits, where not an awful lot was really happening, not an awful lot, even in in Legends in EU, there wasn't an awful lot happening. It was a very wise decision. Whoever chose that time period was was quite astute. And to flesh that out and start that long slope down to Phantom Menace and then and the prequel trilogy when it really goes big time belly up. It's been fascinating. So, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. How about you? Yeah, I think it's been great. You know, it's given that entry point for people in the Star Wars literature that were maybe a little bit hesitant or nervous to get too involved. You know, some of the, the, the forums and platforms and social media discussions around it can get a little bit heavy and people who are in the know and have been around a long time can make it difficult for someone new coming to the scene. High Republic sort of created a clean slate Nobody knew what to expect. Nobody knows where it's going to go. There's maybe one or two characters that obviously we know are going to survive. Yoda, for example. But none of the major characters, none of the plot threads. And I think, you know, we're ending up close to the end of phase one. You know, Lucasfilm basically went with that idea, you know, who is going to survive? Because that's the key thing for me with the High Republic is it's the clean slate. Everybody's story is untold so far. So... We're encountering these characters, we're falling in love with these characters, we're going to lose these characters, we're going to find new ones along the path. I think it's great in that idea. I think the way that they've also targeted it in terms of there's the novels for adult readers, there's young adult content out there, loving the manga stuff that's recently come out from Viz. IDW Comics have been phenomenal, disappointed they're losing the license. Star Wars High Republic Adventures has been great and again it's an entry point for younger readers into the High Republic who can enjoy and follow the story as well. Yeah, the, there's the novels as well for kids as well which has been great so finding that balance across the mediums brilliant Tempest Runner that Calvin did, the audio drama. Another great entry point. I've been loving what Star Wars have been doing with audio dramas. Calvin obviously comes from a background Doctor Who, the big finish stuff. I would love to see Star Wars really commit big style to an audio drama, get a full cast in, you know, cast these roles of the High Republic with talent, you know, the people that we know, actors that we know, and really create a drama to the levels that big finish do with Doctor Who. I'd love to see that. Hey man, it's me, Kevin Smith, Star Wars fan, Fanta Tracks fan. Looking ahead to the future, we're heading towards the end of phase one. As I mentioned, the big tease is who's going to survive. Any thoughts? Because, you know, they've thrown some curveballs in there already. Is there a character you don't want to lose at this stage? I don't want to say too much because if you've not read The End of Rising Storm, <laughs> it could give stuff away. So there's characters that I'm invested in. I'm very invested, weirdly, in Tia Toon, the Sullustan Senator. I think he's a great character. But as hero characters, as Jedi characters, Bell, I, I want to see more from Bell Zetifar. I'd like to see more from Zine. 
from Hard Republic Adventures because, as I say, that issue, I think issue 12, by the looks of it, seems to be the last issue of that ongoing, obviously with IDW losing the license. So hopefully she and other characters will move move on. Even Crix from that, that from that particular story on for the Horror Republic Adventures, you know, he's with the Nihil at the moment. I'd like to see where he goes with that in that storyline. But I don't think anybody's safe because, like you just said, you know, the only ones we know are going to get through it, really. And it's 280 years before Renew Hope, so they're all going to die. Yeah, or most of them, unless there's some real long-lived ones. They're, you know, you're going to see most of them pass on if they if they want to continue this era because they have sort of inferred that I think the acolyte is right at the end of the Horror Republic era, which is quite a few, you know, it's a couple of centuries long. I think Phase One's been very, very interesting. The area I've kind of liked that they've kind of had round about the High Republic is where it's touched other series. So you've had little elements like it's touched on. Lord Santeca, um, having been to planets within the High Republic. I've liked little elements like that. I would like to see more of that. So let's sort of have a Lord Santeca comic series and have part of it cross over into elements that get brought up in the High Republic. They're well into sort of stage two in terms of their plan. Maybe that's something that can be done in the relative near future as well as they're quite clear as to where the series is going to go. So you could have artifacts from the High Republic era age appearing and being a centre point in a modern timeline comic series that's something I would like to see them do yeah there's, it's always nice when they overlap these elements isn't it like you say that you mentioned Law Santeca from Force Awakens and obviously I'll just mention Tarkadanda and Maz also from the Force Awakens that, you know it's a bit like when they brought Galaxy's Edge in and they you know they did the, the great little comic run there the five parter which was really more fun than I thought it had any right to be they're doing it again with the Halcyon uh, Halcyon Legacy with that comic you know and, and they're all kind of a similar MO of embedding these locations or vehicles or characters into the wider lore, which is kind of think what I think you're getting at. You know, it's yep. just nice to sort of embed it all in. So, yeah, I totally agree. And because this feels like, well, I mean, it's been set up the High Republic. You know, it's, this is the Republic at, as, at its best. And I know over the centuries and millennia, it's ebbed and flowed. It's clearly had good times before this. This isn't the only good time, but it's the most recent really good time you'd probably imagine. So, you know, there's there's some good stuff to be mined in there. So I totally agree. I think they could pull in some more really fascinating stuff they could pull in. There was the Tales from Galaxy's Edge VR game from ILMX Lab. Um, they had the sorry, expansion Temple of Darkness that went into High Republic era storytelling and we've also we mentioned Disney Plus um, as well and of course you've got Star Wars The Acolyte as well coming from Leslie Headland as well we might hear more about that in the next couple of weeks as well there's a lot of stuff happening it's appearing in a lot of different places so yeah it's going to be interesting to see the directions that it takes and it feels like they're just warming up feels like they've just uh, laid the groundwork and it's about to really kick off i think yeah that's that's true and and something you said earlier about how they've covered young readers they've covered kids you've got the adult cornerstone novels obviously we've had these big storylines before we had new jedi order we've had uh, it was more compact but you know even shadows of the empire went into different media it's a smaller story and we're kind of having it retold with War of the bounty hunters aren't we but but you know it, it's it's been done before to to varying levels of of intricacy this time around like you say there's something for everybody in the high republic which is which is i think a real bonus to the way they're doing it it's very clever i think it's, it's good to have been fun for the writers we're about to hear from calvin so just focusing on his works you know he's got the adult novel in the rising storm he's had young reader book um, off the top of my head uh, the great jedi rescue he's obviously been heavily involved in the comics he's had the audio drama as well so it's it's good to be fun for the creative as well in terms of they've been able to dabble into different ways of storytelling as well keeps it fresh interesting for them and you know i think they've picked a great um, team of writers and they've let other ones dabble in as well. George Mann's just had a uh, showdown at the fair come out for young readers as well, which is sort of an adaptation of Cavan's novel, which is great because George Mann and Cavan are great friends, have worked together on projects as well. So yeah, seeing that kind of connections as well happening has been really interesting in the seeing the dynamic created as well I like those young readers books one because the, visually they just look so nice those square bound books take you right back to the 80s and you know the Earwalks and Droids books that they did way back when and even earlier than that you know Maverick Moon and stuff it's, it's that sort of format so that's quite evocative but yeah like you say retelling 
you know the second one the George Mann one retelling those those key moments from the Republic Fair attack in Rising Storm was mostly I think the artwork was so gorgeous you know the artwork was absolutely beautiful so again it's another visual element it's not for grown-ups necessarily well none of Star Wars is for grown-ups if you think about it but, but you know these books you look at the artwork in them very very little golden book style artwork really evocative very nice so yeah more of any more of that phase two part of me tells me we're going to go down the sort of the harry potter route where you start off with something quite light and bubbly like philosopher's stone and end up at deathly hallows i kind of wouldn't mind if they did that but it'd be a bit disappointing if they didn't keep folding in the young reader stuff i don't see them not folding in young reader stuff because it's a demographic that they obviously want to attract for everything in one location daily news reviews interviews podcasts video and social media feeds bookmark bathatracks.com for star wars news 24 7 365 So obviously we spoke about Kevin. He did his own panel. After the panel, he did a signing at the Forbidden Planets stand where you could get anything by Kevin signed. Um, he was giving away little pins as well um, for his own James Bond-esque series as well. I, I'm going to hold my hands up right now. You you saw it happen for real. I took a comic with me to get signed by Kevin, but I didn't recognise the signature on the on the front of the comic, <laughs> and it was his signature. And I went, do you recognize his signature? And he says, yeah, that's mine. I went, oh, okay, you don't need to sign that again. So that was kind of embarrassing, <laughs> but uh, full disclosure. But apart from that, yeah, it was very good. It was good to see a big queue of people as well at that Forbidden Planet stand. Again, it was nice to see people out and about and getting stuff signed. It felt a bit more normal, a bit more real. Shadow Service Volume 1 Dark Arts has been published this year. So I've um, picked up that. Um, I actually picked that up at MCM, so I'm looking forward to um, checking that out as well. And uh, after the signing, we grabbed Calvin, took him aside just on the edge of the show floor. And uh, yourself and I had a little chance to a little interview for the first time live at a convention for Fanta Tracks in a long time. So let's go check out this interview. So, Kevin, it's your first convention back since conventions started again. How's, yeah. it, how's it feel? I think when I first walked in, I was a little bit nervous when I suddenly saw there are people here, yes. actual people, you know, real people um, that aren't, you know, on a screen in my room. Yeah. Um, but, no, it's great. It, it's so nice to get back in front of people because that's why we do this, you know, at the end of the day. And I was doing an interview on the live stage, and, you know, it was question, one of the questions was you know what's the most satisfying thing about doing something like the high republic and it is always the fans and the reaction yeah. because we haven't had that we've been doing it largely in a vacuum other than social media yes which you know is the joy of it that at least social media has its problems but also at least that we have had that for the last couple of years um so you know it's been there we have seen that people are excited and so yeah it's been coming here seeing people cosplaying as you know ava chris yes. and vanestra was amazing and so yeah it's it's great to be back here i think as the day is going on i'm i'm calming down a bit and i'm relaxing into it i'm now i will probably go and wander around out his alley in a minute which yeah. i didn't think i was going to this morning but i think i'm now confident enough to do that yeah so because you've been following it online yes. online is one thing it's the beast we're all very familiar yeah, with. yeah but to be out here face up with people asking questions on stage it's a bit more tactile it's not the right word yeah. but you know what i mean it's a bit more real yeah, yeah. how has that felt to, to see the reaction as opposed to read it absolutely brilliant because that's again that's why we've created this thing you know we've created it to be read um we've been you know we created it for people to get invested in these characters and we had no idea if they were going to yeah. so yeah to see people cosplaying is amazing to see people i was just done a sign in at forbidden planet you know to see people come in with every variant there seems to be of the high republic and boy are there a lot of those yeah um, most i haven't seen actually um yeah it's been it's been great because you know people have been talking about their favorite characters coming back you know chastising me for what I've done to their favourite yeah. characters, you know, or, or what we've all done. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, that, it's been fantastic. It's been great because that's why we're all fans here, you know, that's why we are fans of Star Wars, we're fans of everything, you know, all the fans we belong to. Um, it's because you have that communication. And yeah. That's what conventions are about, is chance to go up to a creator and say thank you, or for the creators to say thank you as well. I think that's really important. You know, it gives us the chance to say thank you for keeping reading these books and reading the comics and talking online and creating um, you know, and drawing and uh, everything that we did when we started out as fans as well. That's what we've missed. And so that's what we're doing. 
a lot of what launched phase one of the High Republic was written before pandemic. And then lockdown happens and we all screw ourselves away for however many months it was different, in yeah. different parts of the world. In terms of what, I can't say about anything you're writing, obviously I wouldn't want you to, but in terms of what you're writing post-pandemic, yeah. how different has that felt? Has that had any effect or influence on what you've written? Is it put a different spin on things? Do you think it will bleed into any elements of the story? I think so. I think we were all quite shocked because obviously Light of the Jedi had a lot of elements about, you know, not being able to use hyperspace and, and, and forced quarantine and things. And so it was, yeah, there was suddenly... The world caught up with what we were writing. I don't think we've, we've been particularly... I don't think, it, we, you know, there are elements that you wouldn't want to put in because you want people to read the stuff and not think too much about the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing for us is the fact that we haven't... The five of us haven't been together for that time. We're, we're just planning to get together in January. Um, and while we've been talking every day, you know, yeah. I think it's going to be a very different kettle of fish when we're sitting together in the ranch around a table... And I think we're all looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, so it's it, there. I think there will always be elements. I think some of the stuff about how, not so much about the pandemic, but how governments uh, are dealing with things like social media and news and rolling news. That's definitely something that I think's bled in because I think everyone has our views of rolling news and everything that brings yeah. have changed. And so. Um, and perhaps with some of the governments we've seen throughout these last couple of years and the way they're dealing with things. Yeah, I think that's probably, like, all great art, you know, it sounds very self you know, but, you know, all art is influenced by the world we live in. And so I think there will naturally be some elements that we'll find a way in. That's a great point, because propaganda is a massive part of the Star Wars story, yes. isn't it? The Empire and had a great propaganda been. machine. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming the whole Republic, elements of that, it's going to have a similar spin. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, the great works. You know, yeah, Lena's great works were there right from the beginning. Yeah. And so one of the things that I did in the, in the Rising Storm was want to bring in the element that perhaps there might be people in the Senate. The Senate's a very different place than we see in the prequels. But... We can't have everyone agreeing on everything. You know, no. There would be people who'd look at something like the um, the fair, the Republic Fair, and go, Do, "Are you sure this is a good idea?" And now we're probably saying, "We told you so." Yeah. You know, so that's definitely something we wanted to play with. And yeah, and that probably is something that's being affected by the real world. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that. That um, I'm presuming you're referring to Tier Two being a little bit of a yeah. question mark on things. Yeah, yeah, and I, again, I think a lot of people have. A, ended up agreeing with him, yeah. you know, and reading that as well. And he was never meant to be a, a villain or, you know, he's an antagonist um, for a lot, of, a lot of the people in that book. Um, but it was also us asking the question of, like, should there be a Republic there? Yeah. We always knew from the story, yes, there should. Yeah. But we couldn't just... We couldn't just put it in and not have anyone ask the question because then it wouldn't be believable, you sure. know. Sure. Um, and again, it's hopefully part of the High Republic that there would be the ability for people to question stuff. You know, where, let's face it, in later years in Star Wars, questioning things, people have problems with that. Yes. You know, so <laughs> we wanted to create an environment where people can question. And, you know, and you aren't necessarily a bad guy or, you know, because you're the one going, uh, should we? Um, so, yeah, that's definitely something we wanted to address. There's one element of, of Horror Republic that really stands out to me at least is that when you get to the sort of Phantom Menace era when it still feels like a glorious republic but you know the, the underpinnings are starting to wear away yeah, yeah. but the whole republic feels like the, the deep breath before the plunge sort of thing is that was that always part of the kind of the idea to show the republic at its peak but then we're on a slippy slope now well I think it's everything always comes back to that conversation between Ben and Luke um, in, in his hut in Tatooine you know when he talks about the you know the more you know the eloquent weapons and you know more civilised age yeah and how many of us have wanted to see that more civilised age? And, and yeah, we saw a glimpse of it in the prequels, but that's not what the prequels were for. You know, the whole point, as people are discovering the High Republic, you need conflict. You, you, know, you need some situations happening to test your characters. And the prequels were always going to be a tragedy because of what was coming. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to explore what the glorious Republic would look like. Yeah. Um, but, again, we, you know... Anyone who's reading it knows that it's not exactly, not, it's not been a picnic for no. these characters. And so we wanted to explore a time where the Jedi have become very used to being the Jedi. They have, they've succeeded. They've won. You know, there is peace. No one in their right mind would go against the Jedi. As soon as a lightsaber comes out, they don't need to be turned on. 
and suddenly the Jedi are faced with people who will fight back and they and for them it's a shock and so that's something that we wanted to explore and again it's how it's how they react to it that I find interesting you know it's like when you look at characters from other universes as well when you look at Captain America people you for years saying Captain America is a very dull character as I like, but it's the situation to put Captain America in that prove who Captain America is. Yeah. And same with Superman. And so that's what we wanted to explore. When you put noble Jedi into a situation where nobility isn't, sorry, the nobility isn't the, um, isn't the norm. Yeah. How do they, how do they sink or swim? Um, and, and what cracks will start to appear? And which Jedi will become stronger? Um, and that's what we've been wanting to explore. And I think as well that Star Wars is always stories told in basically in, in history. Mm. So the victors in wars are the ones that tell mm. the history and set the history. And you can yeah. compare it, you can look at the, the glorious British Empire and then how it's perceived yeah, in yeah. more modern times. You can take that in terms of the High Republic and that people can look back at it as being a glorious time. Doesn't mean there wasn't a nasty underbelly. Exactly. There as well. We used Camelot repeatedly when we were developing and both senses of Camelot as in Arthurian and also Camelot in 1960s America, you know, and you look back to the early, and obviously the other guys I was working with, this was, this was their, you know, their recent history as well and their, and their legends. And so they looked at that early era. For some people, they look at the early 60s in, in the States and it is a Camelot, it is a golden age. And there were other people saying, well, not for everyone, you know. And so that's what we've been looking at. We want it to feel real. We want it to feel that, so for a lot of people, it is a golden age. But that's not going to be for every part of the, of the galaxy. It's not going to be for every person on every planet. And also, exploring that nature, not, not everyone on a planet is the same. And that's yeah. one thing that with me in Star Wars, I always struggle with. Not everyone in a species is going to be exactly the same as the next person. And we're trying to explore that as well with the Harry Potter. Was it, sorry, right, was it always the intention then that you wanted it to be as multifaceted as possible so different readers can look at it and follow that line, follow that Yeah, line. yeah, it was always part of, I mean, that's Mike Skillane's master plan. He, you know, he was our Nick Fury and bringing us all together. And part of the brief always was we need stories that can be told in every sort of way. So yeah. we've got stories that can be told to kids, we've yeah. got stories that can be told to the really young, we've got stories that can be told through the Del Rey novels that are a bit more sophisticated. Um, and while you could read everything and hopefully get a, a, an overall picture, it shouldn't punish people who aren't. So it's been a challenge, but it was definitely the way um, that was part of the plan. And, and you will see that happening as we move forward as well, because this is only scratching the surface of what we've planned. Yeah. So, you know, there will be different forms of storytelling as well. Um, and that has been part of the joy of doing it. We've been creating the kind of story you can tell through a different medium. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it brings its own challenges, as I said, but it's also bringing its, its own benefits as well. Yeah. Um, we always had the teaser over the last week that um, we're coming towards the end of phase one and that not everyone's going to survive. Do you find it difficult as a creator because you guys as a group have created all these characters um, from scratch and you're not jumping on from someone else's work? Being the creators, is it more difficult to make the difficult decisions of who lives, who dies? Who oh, lives? absolutely. Yeah, I mean, part of the joy in this is the fact that all bets are off because it is an era that we don't, you know, other than a few Jedi who might have we know end up in the in the prequels, uh, Yoda. Um, we know we can't do too much, you know, to, to Yoda. But what you know, we've got all these other characters that we don't know how they're in and their story is going to end. I mean, Charles often talks about Luke that we now know where Luke started. We've literally seen Luke born and we've seen Luke die. And while that journey could take different ways, we know that we we bookend as far as the Jedi has ever bookended. Um, we haven't got that situation now, you know, and we've kept quite purposely that a lot of the, the names we've included, some of them have turned up in, in later work um, as teasers. But, yeah, we, we wanted to have a world where you go into it not knowing. Um, the same for us. There have been lots of conversations and we've had lots of Zoom calls um, while we're sitting down and we've argued, you know, and you do have that moment when you know the story and the character's arc means they go a certain way. And it's painful to you as a writer, yeah. but you know, that's part of being a writer. And that's the end of the rising storm with no spoilers for people who haven't read it yet. There was something at the end that upset a lot of people and we knew it would, but that was always the way it had to be. And you know, and there were conversations about that. There, you know, do we do this? And every time we take those decisions, we don't take it lightly. And you know, there, and there are 
sometimes heavy debates um, going on. And, you know, can we do this? And it's always about, just, is that what the character needs? Is that what the story needs? And it always comes back to that. And sometimes you do not want to say goodbye to people. And you drew um, the short straw. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, drew the, I drew the short straw at that point. Yeah. There are other short straws, shorter <laughs> straws. So when, when you're writing these books, like Boys and Storm, for example, that, that's written way out. It's got to be printed, it's got to be put together physically, all the other elements and promoted and everything else. Yeah. You're separate from it to a degree by the time it comes out because you've been writing stuff for Marvel. Rise and Storm stuff. was written before the launch. Right. So um, So you had no idea what, how people would connect to certain characters, how people no, would react to certain things. Not at all. And that was terrifying in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, so we, we were right. We were absolutely right in the vacuum. More so, as I said, than we thought we would be, because yeah. obviously it was supposed to be launched six months before. Um, and actually, if everything had run, you know, I would have had a bit more of sense right in the Rising Storm of how it was going. But yeah, as it was, I think I delivered it the week before our launch of it in January. So Are you glad you didn't know too much in that. Yeah, sense, yeah, yeah. But there, there was obviously a slight, it was slightly nervy as well because. Certain characters, if people had hand have taken them to the heart, it wouldn't have landed the way it did. No, sure. And so, I mean, we knew, we knew, we knew the work. Of, we'd done the work, and we hoped it would work. Yeah. Um, but like all these things, you never know until it's so, out there. On a double-edged sword, it's it's kind of got to mean when you see people being attached to a character, you know that well, that future event yeah. is going to pay off it's, in yeah. some way. Yeah, it's when you, you know. see people with the, the, the Twitter handle of the character you know you've just killed, and you're like, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. And they're saying how excited they are to a book or a comic, and you're like, yeah, you might not be in a few weeks' time. <laughs> um, so, don't know how far out you're planning phase two, or how far it's been planned, or whatever. That's not relevant, but does it, in a way, does it feel like, you know, that tricky second album? Because you know the reaction to phase one has been so solid and so good. Obviously, Lucas won't be on it, fans are beyond it, user mm. group are into it. Yeah. I, Do you know what I'm getting at? You go to this Yeah, I mean, we're nervous, now. obviously, yeah. because, you know, it's um, it's going to be different in a lot of ways. And, and so, yeah, it's it's always the tricky second album. Um, but I'm trying to say this as confidently as I can. We also know why the first phase has been successful right. and so we're confident now the second and the third phase so at the minute we're talking about we're working on the third phase sure. and so um, yeah it's 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 always worrying and it's that thing of when when I don't think anyone realised how big the first phase was going to get with people because again we didn't realise what the world was going to look like and we didn't realise how people needed something like this yeah. you know um, but yeah so it it's a, it's a it's a very pleasant kind of trepidation yeah. because you know we're pretty sure people are going to enjoy it, um, but it's you know you take your chances, don't you? Um, but yeah, it's um, I'm excited for people to see it because they're not they're not ready. That's all <laughs> I'm going to say. Thanks to Calvin for joining us um, in that interview live from MCM. Mark, thank you for joining me on this special episode of Cannon Fodder. Fanta tracks people should be subscribing to and um, checking out Making Tracks which you're on with uh, Mark Mulcaster as well Making Tracks every Tuesday I say every Tuesday this week it was on a Thursday uh, life gets busy especially when you've got uh, your co-host is the EXO of the Rebel Legion in the UK who's getting all over the place so uh, yeah we're up in Gateshead this weekend and down in London next weekend so it's all go but yeah um, Making Tracks is going well I know on Good Morning Tatooine you've got Paul Naylor on as a guest and uh, me and him will be launching Start Your Engines very soon, which we've been promising for about two years, but we are going to finally make it happen now that we're not contagious anymore. <laughs> and obviously your thoughts and opinions as listeners is important to us. So head on over to social media, at Fanta Tracks. Let us know what you thought of the interview with Calvin and uh, what you want next from the High Republic as we end phase one and enter phase two at the start of next year. Coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio, it's Cannon Fodder.